Hello everyone, this is Eric, the Asian movie enthusiast. And in honor of the horrors of cold weather, I got my Christmas tree and some icy blue lighting for this evening. And actually, if you want a, an Asian horror film that is set during the Christmas season, I do recommend Present from the Kazuo Umezu Manga Horror Theater box set. I covered that film in my 2005 uh, video. I'm not sure if it was part 3 or 4. But uh, check out my, uh, my video there for some thoughts on that. It's, the villain is Santa Claus, and his weapon is the Star of David. You know you want to watch it. It's a pretty good flick. But in any case, welcome to part two of our exploration of Asian horror films released in 2014. Now we covered most of the crap from this year in part one. The films we're looking at tonight are mostly watchable, in my opinion. They are not high priority titles, but if a few of them sound interesting to you, check them out. Now I did not cover honorable mentions in part one of this video, so I'm going to cover them now. And remember, my honorable mentions are films that may have elements of horror within them, but I do not classify as actual horror films. Now the big one is the Indonesian-Japanese film Killers, which was directed by the Mo Brothers. It's a very interesting and violent thriller that I definitely recommend. You know, it's it's a borderline horror film, but when I rewatched it a few months ago, I don't know, it just felt a little bit more like a thriller to me, so I'm not including it in this playlist, but it's definitely worthy checking out. I do have a full-length review on my channel as well, so check that out as well. Now, some Korean thrillers from 2014 that I think are pretty good are Murderer and Monster, both of which I found to be moderately entertaining, albeit flawed in certain aspects. Also, the violent uh, Japanese thriller Gun Woman is also worth a look. That came out in 2014 and is sufficiently violent and entertaining, I think. In terms of honorable mentions that are terrible, one Japanese thriller comes to mind, and that is a film called Me and 23 Slaves, which has some of the Worst ensemble performances I've seen in years. I would suggest that you steer clear of that one. So, those are my honorable mentions for 2014. So, let's get down to business here. Now, while researching the honorable mentions during the past week or two, I did come across two fairly underwhelming films that really should be classified as horror films that I did not cover in part one of this video. So we're going to cover those two films first this evening, and then we'll move on to the more uh, watchable stuff after that. And as always, titles for all the films I discuss will be listed in the description box below. Now our first film this evening is Conjuring Spirit, also known as Chung Ku Ma, a Vietnamese horror film, of course, from 2014. When moving to a new apartment, a mother and her five-year-old son are consistently haunted by an angry ghost that is hiding in a music box. Now, this woman's husband cheated on her with a younger woman, so she is kind of dealing with the psychological ramifications of a marriage in shambles. And to make matters worse, she's being haunted by the ghost of a woman who was murdered by her lover, as shown in the opening scene of the film. Now, this film starts off... <clears throat> okay. You know, there are a few playful moments early on, uh, kind of hit or miss in their effectiveness, but uh, yeah, pretty good stuff. I do like the female characters in this movie. I think the actresses did a good job, but a few of the supporting male characters were kind of annoying. You know, they kind of got on my nerves. Script writing and story are just kind of run-of-the-mill stuff. The thing that the protagonist actually needs to accomplish in order to appease the ghost is about as generic as you could possibly imagine. <laughs> so if I gave you three choices, you would probably be able to guess it. Uh, one of the twists is pretty lame and too melodramatic for my liking. The ghost girl in this is caked in gray mud and has white eyes, and she does act more rabid than the, than the typical Japanese onryo, so that's a good thing. There's also a scene involving a fetus that I found effective. However, you know, some of the horror scenes are pretty cheesy, especially when they incorporate slow motion. The story moves at a decent pace, but it's simply not memorable enough to earn a recommendation. So Conjuring Spirit is, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag of, of good and not so good stuff. It really does not offer enough 
to earn a recommendation from me. You could probably skip this. Now, the availability of Conjuring Spirit is that it is on Netflix streaming in the United States. Alright, our next film is a sequel to a good film that I covered in 2004. So, does the sequel live up to the original? No. No, it doesn't. And that is Feng Shui 2. This is from the Philippines. Now, the movie continues from the ending of the first film, basically. When uh, twins discover the cursed Bagua mirror in the former House of Joy, played again by Chris Aquino. Now, there is a flashback early on to Joy's attempt to destroy the mirror, interrupted by the realization that some of her family members died in a vehicular accident. Ten years later, the new owner of the mirror becomes afraid when she finds her husband dead in the house. She's then coerced by spirits to jump off of the terrace of their condominium unit. Then, after that, we cut to our main character, Lester, played by Coco Martin, who is told to steal the mirror by an old woman. He is successful at doing so, but the mirror inexplicably keeps showing up at his house and causes more deaths. So this movie starts off rather badly, actually. The opening scene just feels off to me. You know, it's kind of hokey in its execution. It's very rushed. Uh, it involves a ghost woman, and it never really bothers to establish any dread or suspense. It just kind of gets, it rushes right through the scene. It doesn't doesn't set the mood at all. And this is a problem with many of the scares in this film. There's a jump scare involving a cat in the movie, which is, as I always say nowadays, a completely unacceptable event at this point in cinematic history. We should be past these things now, unless you're making a parody or something, satire or something, right? Also, the other scares are, you know, a mix of ghosts and seemingly natural deaths that are linked to the cursed mirror. You know, it, bo it borrows certain elements from its predecessor, and recycles the idea of characters being born in the year of a certain animal and dying in a somewhat ironic manner. And that was used in the prior film uh, as well, but it was executed better there. And it, it felt kind of refreshing to have that introduced into a horror film. This film kind of piggybacks off of it, but uh, doesn't really do anything new with it or, uh, or elevate, it, elevate it in any kind of way. You know, the horror in general in Feng Shui 2 is just limp. Very limp. There's really nothing that memorable that, that uh, is introduced in this movie in terms of the scare tactics. And that, I think, really hurts it. At times, it's actually unintentionally funny, especially when people scream. There's some actresses and actors in here that uh, attempt to scream, and it does not, come off, does not come off well. Now, in terms of positives, the film is well lit, and it has some atmospheric shots here and there. The lead actor does give a good performance. I liked him. Dramatic aspects are decent. Everything is properly explained. I don't think there's really that many plot holes in it. One thing I did like is the relationship between the lead character and the curse, which is a little bit different from other horror films uh, for much of the opening half, but then it descends into a more cliched manner later on. So overall, Feng Shui 2 is not a bad movie. It's simply forgettable and predictable. Check out the original film instead. Now, availability of this one, it's difficult to find. You might be able to catch it on some of the streaming sites that are dedicated to Filipino films, but it may or may not have subtitles. All right, so it's time to cover some movies that I think are more watchable. Okay, they have, I'm modestly recommending them or marginally recommending them. You, you'll, you'll, you could tell based on my reviews here. The first of which is from a director who we've covered before in this playlist. And that film is Kotodama, Spiritual Curse. And this is from Japan. Some schoolgirls learn about a fatal gas accident that occurred at a school in the past. The girls then experience unusual occurrences, like hearing breathing from closed classrooms and seeing a person's shadow. Meanwhile, a girl named Hitomi then sneaks into, into an abandoned school to shoot a horror video for the internet. She hears from her colleague about a fox's window, which leads to a spirit world. And all of these students cross paths at some point in the film, become trapped inside the high school building, and must evade evil spirits. So Kotodama was directed by Masayuki Ochiai, 
the man who previously gave us The Hypnotist from 1999, which is a sweet film, and Infection from 2002, which was good. I've also covered his film The Arm, which was included in the Kaiden Horror Classics Project from 2010. That one was pretty good as well. The script writing in Kotodama is difficult to assess for me because I viewed this film without subtitles, so I can't really speak about the script in this. The acting, what I can't say, <laughs> is a mixed bag, okay? It ranges from decent to crap. Some of the male actors, in particular, are really bad in this and take away from the experience. That's definitely a negative of this film. I am happy to say, however, that this flick is loaded with horror content, you know, some of which is pretty interesting, I think. The Onryo ghost does show up a few times, which results in some cliched moments. But there are other scares mixed in as well, like rotting legs and plentiful use of mirrors. Yes, there, there were moments in this film that surprised me when I realized that I was actually looking at a mirror image, like a reflection. And you don't realize it at first, so that's kind of a cool aspect of this film, is how they use mirrors in various ways. Atmosphere is you know, nicely earned in ways that are familiar to fans of Japanese horror. You, know, you have a blend of glacial pacing, ambient sounds, and effective natural lighting indoors. You know, there's something about Japanese horror films, you know, in a lot of cases where they use natural lighting well in buildings during the daytime. You know, you see this a lot in the Juon franchise. You know, there's some scary scenes in those films that take place in the middle of the day inside a house. So, uh, you know, I would say that the lighting in this film is also pretty effective in that way, in Kotodama. My biggest criticism of the scares in this film is that some of the scenes involving the dude, there's a dude who's dressed like an Onryo ghost, and they're making almost like a short film in the school. Those scenes were a bit too goofy for my liking. You know, I did not like his character. He was just kind of a goofball. Kind of took away from the atmosphere a little bit too much. A few other scenes themselves are pretty goofy as well, like the finale, which uses a, a very weird camera effect that was just awkward and not in a good way. <laughs> it just, it did not work for me. I know uh, Ochio might, might have been trying to create kind of a, I don't know, something that's a little spooky and different, but it didn't really work for me at all. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to be giggling at the finale or not. And uh, yeah, that, again, all of this was not expressed in, in, in a good way. But Yes, there are some cheesy moments in this film, and the acting can get pretty bad at times, but I do think that Kotodama is watchable fluff. It is. There's enough horror in it. It's got enough positives to, to be watchable on a, uh, a lazy afternoon, so I marginally recommend this one. Availability on this, it's available on YouTube with subtitles. I think it's you have to rent it for a few bucks. It's also on Region 2 DVD without subtitles. All right, and it looks like we will be hitting a variety of countries in different areas tonight because our next film is from Hong Kong. In fact, I think every film that we're talking about tonight is from a different country, just out of coincidence. So, pretty interesting evening here, even if the films themselves are not all that great. And this film is called Sifu vs. Vampire. This is from Hong Kong. It's a horror comedy. Now, don't leave an exhumed corpse in the wrong place. Some small-time gangsters find this out the hard way in this tribute to 1980s-era Hong Kong vampire flicks. It is said that, they, that a corpse should be exhumed and moved every 30 years to ensure continued fortune and prosperity for its descendants. As the time limit is nearing for his grandfather's corpse, TV station boss Kelvin looks to Charlie, played by Yun Bao, whose ancestors performed the ritual for the family to complete his task. You know, he wants them to move the body and continue their fortune. But Charlie refuses, citing his belief, his personal belief, that the ritual itself is unethical due to the dead body sucking all of the luck from the living descendants of other nearby graves. And after that, after he, after he refuses, conflict develops, and uh, there could be some vampires that pop up. Now, since this is a horror comedy, I need to address the humor. And some of the gags are actually sex-based and somewhat juvenile at times, which is not my thing. You all know this by now. But it is occasionally funny and creative. It is. I give the film credit 
there are some funny moments in this. So even though the comedy is not my style, I did find some of it amusing. The culturally specific techniques of vampire hunting is the main reason to watch this film. You know, if you've seen some of the old school stuff from Hong Kong, you'll have an idea of what to expect. There's just something different about Hong Kong vampire flicks that you're not going to get from any other film industry in the world. So it's nice to, to revisit films like this on occasion as a, as a palate cleanser, you know, for something a little different. There is a bit of CGI in this modern take, but it's not that bad. CGI is decent in this film. It does get bloody at times, and there's, there's a bit of spooky atmosphere as well. Sifu vs. Vampire is not nearly as good as the best films in the Mr. Vampire series, for example. Uh, one of the big reasons for this is that the fights themselves are not all that impressive. You know, they're low in number, uh, mostly occur near the end of the film, and are generally, you know, just kind of mediocre in terms of their overall quality. You know, there's not a lot of action until, like I said, the end, and the finale, I would say, was just pretty good. You know, this is especially disappointing when you look at the cast in this. you got Yun Bao, Lucia Zhang, and Philip Ng. And Philip Ng is just continually underutilized in the Hong Kong film industry. Uh, he was, he's actually in another film I'm covering, I think either tonight or next uh, part, where he only has a bit role. It's like, this guy needs headline roles. If you want to see him in a headline role, go check out uh, Once Upon a Time in Shanghai. That's a good one. He gets a lot of screen time and he kicks a lot of butt in that one. But he doesn't do much in this flick, you know, which is pretty disappointing. And Lucia Zhang also, and Yun Bao. So that's kind of disappointing for sure. But still, this is one of those silly films that contributes enough entertainment value for a lazy afternoon, as I say. It's not bad. DVD availability on this. It's available on Region 3 DVD with subtitles, as well as some legitimate streaming sites like Sinflix. Alright, time to skip to yet another country, South Korea. This film is called Manhole. It's a horror thriller hybrid. In a neighborhood in Seoul, a handful of people disappeared without a trace during a six-month period. While the neighbors feel nervous about the police failing to provide or bring the culprit to justice, hair and blood is found on the lid of a manhole which prompts speculation that the murderer is using the underground passageways. Now, our two main protagonists here are a woman named Yun So and her younger sister, Su Jung, or Su Young, sorry, who is deaf. Her parents passed away and they're living together with the older supporting the younger. But after Su Young is abducted by the serial killer, Yun So descends into the sewers to stage a rescue. Now, I must admit that I was pretty freaking excited for this movie when it first came out. When I first heard about it, the reason is because it stars both Yumi Jung and Seiran Kim, two of my favorite actresses in the world right now. You know, I would I immediately became a fan of Seiran Kim after her performance in A Brand New Life from 2009, and Yumi Jung earned my fandom through a batch of films, a small batch of films and K dramas from the you know late 90s and early 2000s, with uh, you know oddball films like Cafe Noir and uh, K-dramas like I Need Romance Season 2 being particularly memorable. So when I heard that both of these actresses would be in the same horror film, I got stoked. I got stoked. I was expecting a lot from this movie. Now, unfortunately, while Manhole proved to be a moderately entertaining affair, it ultimately fell short of greatness for reasons that I'll mention. Now, first and foremost, there are some questionable decisions that are made by some of the protagonists mostly in the form of going down the manhole alone. You know, the script does try to justify these decisions by having, you know, one person go out for revenge. You know, they don't want the cops involved because they want to take this dude out because he murdered one of the relatives. Another person sees a victim who is in immediate danger getting taken down into the sewers, and, you know, since the danger is immediate, they try to save them right then and there instead of, you know, calling for help or going to ask for help. Which, eh, you know. <laughs> and then, uh... Also, there's plenty of instances where the streets are empty in this movie. You know, there's, uh, you know, nobody's always, there's always no one walking around the street to help anyone. So if somebody's like trying to escape from a manhole or is near some type of uh, outlet that's blocked, but they, they can see out of it and call for help, 
there's almost never somebody on the other end in the street that's there to help them. And I think the movie tries to justify that by having the killer attack in the middle of the night. So, you know, I'm not sure <laughs> all these justifications are particularly convincing. Uh, and it did distract me a little bit by watching the film the first time around. But, you know, after rewatching Manhole fairly recently, these potential contrivances did bother me a little bit less than they did on my first viewing. Maybe because I knew they were common. The cops are portrayed as rather bumbling, of course. You know, Korea really needs to stop portraying police officers this way in their movies. You know, it, it's an unnecessary cliche at this point in their film industry. But to this cop's credit, the main cop does act in a diligent manner in pursuing clues. If he thinks something wrong, something's wrong, he does pursue it, even though he's kind of a bumbling dude. You know what I mean? So he'll, he's not like those other cops in some of these other Korean films and TV shows where, you know, the cop is just too lazy to do anything. <laughs> so I give him that much credit. Now on a positive note, okay, there are some suspenseful sequences and scenarios to enjoy here. This is kind of a slow burn uh, film with a lot of walking in sewer tunnels and, and under uh, kind of, uh, what would I call it? underground passageways you know as the protagonists attempt to find their loved ones or while avoiding the killer's detection and it works well in that regard i did like those aspects of the film and those do occupy much of the film there are a few effective traps that are set by the villain as well as a few good scenes involving infrared goggles it does get sufficiently creepy at times as well i will admit that the hearing disability of seiron's character does come into play at certain points which I liked. They did play off of that. And the fact that we have a small handful of people separately exploring the underground uh, infuses an interesting element <clears throat> of how these individuals will meet and interact, or if they will meet and interact, as protagonists. Because you may not know who the villain is. You know, these people may not have seen this guy's face. So if you see another person roam in the sewers... You don't know that they're trying to help a loved one or, or go off for revenge against this guy. So there's that aspect as well. <clears throat> and I like that. Uh, the villain is good enough. He keeps his victims in these underground hideouts. And you wonder how long he's going to keep them alive. You know, I mean, there's really no consistency in that regard. He's a little nutty. So it's, uh, it's pretty dangerous down there. There, are, there were a few brief flashbacks that show that he had like a traumatic event in his childhood related to fire. And that plays into the film at various points as well. The acting by Yumi and Seiran is very good, as usual, and expected. Their interaction and bonding moments early on in the film I thought were very effective. The film looks good. You know, the way that the sewers and underground passageways are portrayed is atmospheric. So there is enough in this film to earn a modest recommendation. You know, I do think it has some flaws in terms of like script writing and character decision making, uh, note most notably. But, you know, if you can... Put some of that aside and forgive some of that. This is a pretty entertaining flick, I think. I liked it. I liked it a little bit more after a second viewing. Availability on Manhole. It's available on Region 3 DVD with subtitles, as well as some streaming sites like Sinflix. All right. We now return to another installment in a long-running franchise. I covered all of these other films, or all the other installments up to this point, so I'm going to breeze through this one. Just give you a flavor of what it's about. And I am talking about Yami Doga 10, also known as Tokyo Videos of Horror 10. This is a Japanese horror anthology. Like the others, it's an anthology of five documentary-style horror films. So... The first story is called Scene of an Affair. Suspecting his wife of having an affair, a man places a hidden camera inside his home while away for work, and he catches a glimpse of a bizarre phenomenon. Now, this has an odd ending, but is quite different and moderately enjoyable. In Black Hand, the second story, the victim di or video distortion of a man's face is recorded. You know, The distortion itself is actually lengthy, hellish, and, and quite strange. Pretty good segment. The third story, Putrid Smell, is about a TV crew that is covering a crime in a residential area and they encounter a strange phenomenon. You know, this has an interesting little event that sets up a legitimately scary image, I think. In Cruise Ship, 
A tourist on a cruise ship captures a creepy image while at sea. Decent stuff. And the final segment, Yosuke-kun, uh, is about a woman who is visited by a strange person. He constantly knocks on her door and speaks in gibberish. And this begins in a fairly annoying manner, I would say, but ends with a you know, pretty creepy scene, I think. So, this anthology has a total runtime of only 58 minutes. You know, it's in the, it approximates the other installments here. But I think the simplicity of the events here establishes uh, a palpable creepiness and spookiness that I liked. You know, like I always say, if you want to check out this series, you start with Yami Doga 12, also known as Tokyo Videos of Horror 12, uh, which is my personal favorite. If you do not like that one, I say skip the rest, <laughs> in my opinion. You know, I've only seen that segment one time, or that uh, anthology, the part 12 one time, so my opinion on that might change when I rewatch it in the near future, but yeah, I'd say start with part 12. If you don't like it, don't bother with the rest. If you do like part 12, then you can check out some of the other installments, like part 2, 4, 6, 9, 10, and then the final segment of part 8 is particularly good. Uh, you can watch them in any order, but uh, yeah, I kind of like this series. It's pretty good. Availability of the Yami Doga films, most of them are on Amazon, U.S. streaming site, with subtitles. And our final film for this evening in part two is one that was actually surprisingly entertaining. And that is Zombie Fight Club, the Taiwanese horror action flick. So it's the end of the century at a corner of a city. In a building riddled with crime, a SWAT team led by Michael Wong and Andy On raid this building. But unfortunately for them, they arrive immediately after a zombie outbreak. Now, most people in the building have turned into zombies, and the remaining humans are attempting to survive, as they usually do under these circumstances. Will humans work together or fight against one another in the ultimate act of selfishness? So the first thing I should mention is that this film was directed by Joe Chen, the same guy who gave us The Apostles in Zombie 108, two terrible movies. Uh, in fact, I've, I've read that Zombie Fight Club is a spin-off to Zombie 108, so I was definitely surprised that I actually enjoyed this movie. The opening 10 minutes, kind of obnoxious in terms of character interaction and gratuitous sexual content. You know, I really need to emphasize that Zombie Fight Club is the kind of film that could very quickly get on my nerves because it's just so trashy. This movie is so trashy. Like, all of the actresses are scorching hot, scantily clad, for really no good reason, give terrible performances, <laughs> and are backed up by a pretty poor script. But for some reason, this movie had just enough positives to make it enjoyable for me. So first of all, it is very fast-paced and violent. Okay, the body count is very high, there's danger around every corner, and there's plenty of bloodletting for fans of gore. Blood is a mix of CGI and practical effects, but uh, the tone is mostly serious and even a bit sleazy and mean-spirited at times. You know, the camera definitely bathes itself in the blood and guts in this film. Uh, even when someone gets shot, it shows you what a head looks like after it's shot. It's, it's pretty disgusting stuff at times, and uh, there's a lot of it. So, if you're into that kind of thing, that's a positive. One of the biggest problems I had with this director's other films was the atrocious editing and direction and camera work that made it difficult to see what was happening in those films. Um, it was almost headache-inducing. You know, he thankfully cleaned some of that up in Zombie Fight Club, because the direction is a big improvement in this film. You know, it's not great, but at least it's sufficient here. I can actually make out what's happening on screen all of the time, and the camera work did not irritate me, so good job. Good job. Andy Yon is always fun to watch, and he has a lot of screen time here. He's basically the main character, at least the male lead, so that's a good thing, for sure. And Michael Wong is also entertaining here in a supporting role. And finally... There is a Fight Club section of the film. You're probably wondering, why is this called Zombie Fight Club? Well, there is a Fight Club section of the film that I'll let you discover for yourself. But it does not arrive until later on, with much of the film prior to that being a survival horror film in the apartment building. 
There's actually a time shift at one point. Uses some pretty lazy script writing, but, uh, eh, whatever. <laughs> the ending is a bit of an anticlimax as well. And, as I mentioned previously, Philip Ng is in this film in a cameo. I and mean, why not put him in as Andy Owens, like, uh, you know, side character or something. Somebody to, to fight the zombies with Andy Owens. I mean, they worked well together in, uh, Once Upon a Time in Shanghai, so... I don't know. <laughs> I would add, you always need more Philip Ng in a movie, okay? You always need more of him. But in any case, hey, you know, I kind of enjoyed Zombie Fight Club, and I wouldn't mind watching it again in the future. So, you know what? I would moderately recommend it. It's available on DVD and Blu-ray in the United States, as well as Amazon Prime and Sinflix, so it's all over the place. It's, it's, not, it's not bad. I don't think it's bad. But I can see some people getting really annoyed with it. So those are the films for this evening. Uh, that concludes part two of our journey through Asian horror films released in 2014. I am going to break this up into a five-part video, which is why I'm covering you know less uh, films in each part. But uh, I do think the film distribution for this year does justify a five-part uh, segment or five-part uh, video. So, part three will be next. Be sure to join me for that. And we're going to dis uh, talk about films that are probably a little bit better than the films that we talked about this evening. And then parts four and five will be dedicated to some of my favorite films from this year, as usual. And uh, But again, if any of the films tonight sounded interesting to you, check them out. You know, we had a few, uh, I don't know, a few interesting ones tonight. I feel like Zombies, why not? Zombie Fight Club, you know what I mean? If you like uh, slow burn thrills, check out Manhole, you know what I mean? Etc. You know, you know what to do at this point. So, yes, and uh, be sure to check out the next part when it comes out. You know, again, uh, I'm not ready to cover 2015 yet in Asian horror, so I'm kind of dragging 2014 out a little bit. Part 3 will probably be out in the next month or two. Uh, because once I finish 2014, I don't think I'm ready to go right into 2015, so bear with me. But in any case, watch my old videos. You can watch this whole playlist over and over again, right? All right. I'll see you next time.